Hi, today I'm going to be talking about intuition. And specifically, uh, I'll be reviewing a book called Harebrain Tortoise Mind, How Intelligence Increases When You Think Less. It's a book I read about 10 or 15 years ago, and it changed how I think about intuition. And so, but what fascinated me most about this book is um, intuition can be quantified and measurable. I'll get to that in a second. So I'm, I'm going to be talking about three main things. First, what is intuition? Second, how does intuition happen? What's the mechanism? And third, what does intuition feel like? So, but but first, so Guy Claxton, the author, and he's um, he's a I believe a neuropsychiatrist type um, with some Buddhist training, which is kind of an interesting mix. He talks about us having essentially two minds. The active thinking mind, the hair brain, that's the part of the brain where, you're, where you compute, and, you know, reason through things, etc. And the tortoise mind, the tortoise mind um, he refers to as the sub mind. That's, that's what happens in the background uh, when you're daydreaming, or, you know, etc. And, and these two parts of your brain um, serve very different functions. So, for example, the hair brain, if I ask you, what is 6 times 35? It takes you a minute to cognitively process that, and you come up with you know, 210. You know, and uh, but that's uh, it's it's actively it's actively thinking. Um, the, the tortoise mind is is very good at uh, detecting complex patterns and making connections and having insight into things things that aren't computed. So here's how it was. Here's how it was detected. They they set up a lab experiment where they where they brought people in and they showed them seven screens, and uh, you know a batch of seven screens. and And the name of the game that they were playing was Find the Five. The screen was divided into quadrants, and one of the quadrants had a five in it, and you know amongst all the other numbers, and they needed to click on the quadrant with the five. And what they were measuring is how long it took them to find the five. Unbeknownst to the participants, the, lo the quadrant in which the five was located um, could be computed with an algorithm. If you knew where it was, for example, in the second, the third, and the sixth quadrant, you could compute where it was going to be on the seventh. And so they, they had people go through several batches of seven screens. And the time of their seventh click came down. The rest of them stayed up, you know, at the same time, but the seventh got progressively better. Subconsciously, they, their brain detected the pattern and directed them to the right quadrant, and they were able to find the five much more quickly. Um, so they, they told them, hey, just letting you know there's an algorithm. You can actually, um, they, they told them what the algorithm was, that they should be able to compute what the seventh one was. Seventh time went right back up with everything else. Once the active brain got involved and turned off, you know, the that's the weakness of the submind or intuition is it can't shout over the active thinking part of the brain. If you're actively thinking, you're not going to be able to get input from the submind. You know, they, they even told them, I believe they even told them what the algorithm was, and they still, their times were still higher. The, when they performed the best was when they were completely unaware and their brain just found found the pattern. Um, okay, so here's here is well an, another another example. Um, you you meet somebody and you forget their name, and you're racking your brain trying to remember what it was, and you can't remember it. And then a few minutes later, it pops into your mind. So let me let me show you graphically, and it walks through this in the book what's going on. So you've got. So this dark pathway is, this is where your, your uh, thoughts and brain go while you're actively thinking. You're pushing it through this pathway. And the harder you think, the more you're pushing it through this pathway. And this little blue dot represents what the answer is. So finally you give up. And you stop forcing your thoughts to go down this pathway. And they, your sub-mind just kind of wanders. And, oh, hey, there it is. That's the name. The name is Jones. And so, you, oh, it pops into your head, Jones. But it won't happen while you're actively thinking about it because you're pushing things down the wrong path. Okay, so the problem is in Western culture, 
we reward active thinking. That's the only type of thinking we, we really recognize. Who's the smart kid in the classroom? It's the one who has the ready answer. Who's the smart person at the meeting? It's the one who very quickly comes up with a snappy response to whatever the question is or has a, a, a you know, is confident and has a, a solution immediately. Well, uh, with Native American cultures, or some of them, the, the wise man in the village was the one who would go and sit on a rock for three days and meditate and then come back and say, here's the answer. Who's smarter? Who's going to come up with a better answer? The person who's, you know, you can only actively think about two or three different variables. You can't handle more than that. Subconsciously, you can handle enormous quantities of data. Who's going to come back with a better answer? So um, now, it several religions, I mentioned um, Guy Claxton, I think had Buddhist training, but several religions um, recommend a, a meditative state for pondering problems. So if you have a, a question or something that's perplexing you, they recommend either meditating or perhaps reading scriptures or saying a prayer, something that takes your mind somewhere else, maybe going to a holy place, you know, <clears throat> going to a temple or a cathedral and just letting your mind ponder the things of the universe. The, the mistake, in my opinion, that people make when they try to um, meditate or ponder is they think that means closing their eyes and fixating on whatever the problem is they're trying to solve. And that's just absolutely backwards. Um, there, there's a reason they say, no, just go ahead and meditate and ponder. Ponder something, meditate something. It's to let the sub-mind go to work, in my opinion. Okay, so wanted to talk about what does intuition feel like? So you've managed to shut off the active thinking part of your brain. An idea pops into your head, and usually when they come in, they are fully clothed and ready to go. So much so that artists often feel guilty taking credit for the, the work that they create because they say, I, I didn't create that. It, I wrote it down, but I didn't create it. Handel, when he came up with the Messiah, he didn't talk, he didn't say, I, you know, I methodically went through and thought it through. He describes kind of a state of just trying to capture it all as it appeared to him. John Denver um, used to talk about, he talked about some of his songs. He was just skiing up in Aspen and he saw a song floating by and as soon as he got to the bottom of the hill, he wrote down as much of it as he could remember. They, they don't feel like they create these things as much as, as discover them fully clothed. It doesn't feel like they came from, from you. Um, another interesting thing, they, uh, oftentimes when people are, when the sub-mind is active and this intuition pops into their head fully clothed, um, Claxton reports that they, sometimes they'll, they'll get a warm feeling in their chest. Do with that what you will. Now, the thing is, is if you're, if you were to interrupt someone like Einstein, you know, Einstein used to go into these meditative states. If you were to ask him, Hey, what, what are you thinking about? Probably come out of it and say, Oh, um, nothing. And that would be true. He, wouldn't be actively thinking about anything. That's that's not what made him smart. It it wasn't, his, well, yeah, okay, so he could actively compute stuff, but his insight came while the active part of his brain was turned off, and that's the trick, is training yourself or learning how to turn off the active part of, part of your brain. Um, so, for example, a strategy that I use, if, if I can't remember something, if I'm struggling for a word, which happens a lot for me, if I shift gears and just think about something totally different, I'll find that the answer or the word will pop into my head. Uh, this video has gone gone on long enough. Uh, now, oh, last thing that I need to warn you about. Fascinating concept. Boring, boring, boring book. Um, it's a bit of a slog. Fascinating information, but it he makes you work for it. Um, but go ahead and check it out. Check it out and just kind of thumb through it. If you want to read it, you can. I'm just... If uh, if you struggle with it, don't worry. You're not the you're not the dumb one. It's just it's at a written at a very elevated level, and it's hard to follow, or at least it was hard to follow for. It was hard to enjoy, I guess is the way to put it. But I love the insights that were in it. That's all. Talk to you later.